Proverbs chapter 18. Now, you know that last week I got very personal with you and told you about my cancer and told you about how this proverb really hits me. Well, Proverbs is a study on the way of wisdom. I've broken chapter 18 down into three sections. Very hard to study the book of Proverbs because it looks like the verses are everywhere. So I'm putting them together to make some uh, cohesion out of them. Last week we talked about never walking alone in chapter 18 verses 1 through 10. And I shared with you a vision that I had when I was in really the throes of death in my second uh, chemotherapy. This whole proverb is something that is, has hit me and it's something that had to do with my, with my sickness. I do not like talking about those six months that I went through chemotherapy. I don't like talking about it at all. Matter of fact, I don't talk about it much. And the only time I do is when I'm, I'm teaching about it. So the next one will be words kill and words give life in 18, 15 to 24. So tonight, it's your spirit will sustain your body when it's sick. Now, I want to say things right off the bat. You need this verse. Every single one of us need this verse because it's a life message. Uh, tonight, we venture into the second part of this, of this three-part drama, our second theme. Again, your spirit will sustain your sick body. A verse that, as I'll explain later, ministered to me in that critical time of my life and still does. So let's read the four verses. That's all we're going to read and study tonight uh, that go along with it. Uh, the rich man's wealth, he starts off with obviously something that doesn't seem like it connects. The rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall is his own esteem. Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. He who answers the matter before he hears it, it is a folly and shame to him. And then our text, or the one, or one we're pointing out, the spirit of man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? So we're going to take those all apart, and uh, quite a bit. So let's look at Proverbs 18.11 first. It says it this way, the rich man's, this is King James, the rich man's wealth is his strong city, and has a high wall in his own conceit. And Solomon ought to know about riches. You see, Solomon wasn't only the wisest man in the world, I think Solomon was the richest man ever in the world. And all you have to do is go to Scripture to find out how rich Solomon was. So, I think he also could have been the, the richest man ever, even among men today that are rich. According to Scripture, Solomon's gold mines helped him accumulate over 500, 500 uh, tons, not ounces, tons of pure gold. 500 tons of pure gold. With a value today worth, are you ready for it? Three trillion dollars. So that's with a T. So Solomon was worth, just in gold alone, $3 trillion. Let me give it to you scripture-wise. Second Chronicles. Every year King Solomon received over 25 tons of gold every year. He reigned for 40 years. Uh, in addition to it, the taxes, in addition to the taxes he paid, I'm just talking $3 trillion, just the gold. You're going to see some other things he has that's worth more, way more uh, addition to it. In addition to the taxes paid by the traders and merchants, uh, kings of Arabia, and the governors of the Israelite districts also brought him silver and gold. That's in addition to this 25 tons a year. Solomon made 200 large shields, each of which were covered with about 15 pounds of beaten gold. 200 shields with 15 pounds, not ounces, of beaten gold. You can't imagine how much that would be worth today. It goes on at 300 smaller shields, each covered with about 8 pounds of beaten gold. He had them all placed in the hall of the forest of Lebanon. Now, let me just tell you something. There have been people looking for decades, millennia, for Solomon's gold mines. They've been looking. There's been movies made about it. Uh, they've never been able to find it. Solomon hid his gold somewhere. It did not get passed on to his sons, to his son Rehoboam. Rehoboam actually retaxed the people because he didn't get it. So it's there someplace. We don't know where it is, but it's there someplace. It goes on and says this. Uh, he had a place in the hall of forest of Lebanon. The king also had a large throne made. Part of it was covered with ivory. And the rest of it was covered with pure gold. If you don't know where ivory comes from, that's elephants, which were not indicative to uh, Israel. Six steps led up to the throne, and there was a footstool attached to it covered with gold. There were arms on each side of the throne, and the figure of a lion stood at each side. Twelve figures of lions were on the steps, one at either end of the step. No throne like this had ever been existed in any other kingdom. All of Sol King Solomon's drinking cups were made of gold. All the utensils in the hall of forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Now, I'm going to tell you in a moment how much grain Solomon took in. When we're talking about a hall that seats people and cups, when Solomon went to dinner, it wasn't with four or five people. Remember, he had 300 wives and 700 concubines. And we believe that they all were dining together and along with an entourage that was there. So you can't even imagine the scope of this. All the king's drinking cups are made of gold. All the utensils in the hall of forest, eleven were pure gold. Silver wasn't even considered valuable in Solomon's day. He had a fleet of ocean-going ships sailing with King Hir Hiram's fleet. Every three years, his fleet would return bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and monkeys. Now, this is a reproduction of Solomon's uh, throne. I don't think it does it any justice at all. 
but it would have been pure gold. You walked in that throne room and your eyes would pop out. And it goes on a little bit further, and it tells us in 2 Chronicles 9.22, King Saul was richer and wiser than any other king in the world. So when I said that he's the richest man, the Bible tells us that. He's richer and wiser than... How many of you did not know that? Come on, you can raise your hands. It's all right. Okay, now I'm going to ask you how many know it, but remember, if you lie, it's not worth it. So how many of you knew it? All right, so here you go. They all consulted him to hear the wisdom that God had given him. Each of them brought Solomon gifts, articles of silver and gold. Look, they're giving him 25, pounds, 25 tons of gold a year, and then, now you're seeing all this other gold that's coming to him. Robes, weapons, spices, horses, mules. This continued year after year. King Solomon also had 4,000 stalls in his chariots and horses. He had chariot cities. When I take people to Israel, I bring them to Megiddo. Remember Megiddo? Megiddo, Megiddo was one of three Salmonic cities. Uh, Gezer was another one, and Hatzor was another one in the north. And they were only for Solomon's horses and his chariots. He never went to war, not a day in his life. Never, never shot one arrow. None of, his, uh, none of his soldiers ever shot an arrow. Solomon was the wisest man in the world. Somebody wanted to go against him, he married their daughter. <laughs> That's how he got a thousand concubines. And he had children, so who's going to go against their grandchildren? So he's marrying every king's daughter all over the place, and the kings love it because they're part of his kingdom now. So he never went to war. That's, I guess that's wisdom, until you have to sit down with a thousand wives. I don't know. Uh, then it says, King Salmos had 4,000 stalls for his chariots and horses. Megiddo is, they'll take you there. You can still see the stalls, stalls by the way. Had 12,000 cavalry horses but he never used any of them. Some of them he kept in Jerusalem and the rest he stationed in various other cities. I just told you the three cities. He was the supreme ruler of all the kings in the territory from the Euphrates River. That's from Ur the Chaldees, which would be the Persian Gulf. And from the Ur the Chaldees or Persian, Euphrates River to Philistia and the Egyptian border, which is all the way down to the Sinai. During his reign, silver was as common in Jerusalem as stone. That's unbelievable. And cedar was as plentiful and ordinary sycamore in the foothills of Judah. Solomon imported horses from Musri and from every other country. Now, I don't know if I'm a little weird or not, but I like to, I like to search out things. I like to do the research. So I was thinking about Musri. How many have ever heard of Musri? How many know where Musri is? I'm glad I came today. Musri is here. We know it today as Musiri. Musiri is in, he's importing horses from here, by the way. This is the distance. It's in India. So he's getting, in, he's getting horses from India. And uh, not, um, they wouldn't mention it with just a couple of them. Remember, he has thousands of horses. These are known, these horses are known uh, for their strength. So he's taking them and obviously somehow coming up through the water somewhere down here, either, either landing right where he owns, which is Ur the Chaldees, which is right here, Kuwait, or coming up through here, which he also owns over to here. So he's taking those horses and basically he has a trade of bringing all those horses in. So Solomon is somebody that is extremely rich. So when he writes about about the riches and rich men, he ought to know, which I'll tell you that again in a moment. And so we can see where Musri is. Now, just to give you a, a brief recap, the Bible also tells us this. 25 tons of gold per year, 6,000 kilos, that's 6,000 times 2.2 2, 2 .2 of wheat per day. That's for making bread, by the way. So you're talking about, about 10,000 pounds of, of wheat per day. He's feeding his nation. Just like Rome did. Rome fed every single inhabitant in Paul's day with wheat. They had wheat barges. Paul's shipwreck was on a wheat barge from Alexandria, which is Egypt. And they fed their people. They gave them a daily ration of bread. So their ships were going constantly. Well, that was a common practice in a very, a very prosperous society. Wouldn't you like to see America do that? That you can go to the store and every place you went to the store, every time there was bread there, you get it free? That's exactly what happened in Rome. That's exactly what happened in Solomon. 12,000 kilos of beef per day. And he got 4,000 kilos of other meats per day. So he's feeding a whole lot of people, not just his own entourage, but he's feeding a lot of the nation. And so Solomon is extremely prosperous now. So he's well qualified. My whole point is this. He's well qualified to write about what riches do to men. Uh, here's another way of Proverbs 18.11 is translated. Why do I always want more? The Proverbs 18.11 says, The rich man thinks of his wealth as an impregnable defense. A high wall of safety, what a dreamer. Solomon is saying this. This is the richest man in the world saying the rich men think that they can, they're safe in a tower. By the way, who do you think, does anybody know who the richest men in the world are today? I am amazed that you actually know that, to be honest with you. I'll be real honest with you, I'm amazed. If I talk to 100 people, they'd never know that. Most people say Bill Gates, most people say... Actually, Vladimir Putin is the richest man in the world, and you know it. 
Now watch. Here it is. You have 3.5 billion for Trump. Zuckerberg is uh, Facebook 71.6. Warren Buffett 75.1. Bezos 85.8. Uh, Gates 89.9. And Putin is estimated to either from 40 billion to 200 billion. He keeps it pretty secret, but it's really Russia is really his nation. He is extrapolating everything he possibly can out of Russia. Uh, this man is a money hog. And so he may be the actual richest man in the world. So he's saying things, Solomon's saying some things, and it's pretty powerful. Listen to what he's saying. And again, before I explain the verse, let me, let me actually show you these are the richest men in the world. Let me remind you now that even Putin, at 200 billion, if that's what he has, would have only 1 50th of Solomon's worth just in his gold. Just 1 50th, just in that gold that comes to it. So Solomon way passes these guys. I mean, these guys are like, they have nothing compared to Solomon. And Proverbs 18.11 tells us that most, not all, but most rich people are very proud of their wealth. They feel safe because of their riches. But now watch. Solomon says that if they are not careful, their pride and their conceit will build a wall around them, and others will not care to come near them. The rich man sometimes thinks that his riches will save him from harm, but God isn't impressed by his riches. And I'm in, you know, it would be one thing if Solomon said that when he was a poor king. He said that and he was the richest person that ever lived on the planet. So he ought to know. And so riches are not something that we're supposed to... It, it can actually have a, a, dual, uh, a harmful effect on us if we allow it. That's why Jesus talked about it's easier for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get to heaven. The eye of a needle is actually a doorway, a gateway, and a wall. It's called a needle. The camel has to take everything off, get on its knees, and go through it. He said, but it could happen, but it's because you, your riches will insulate you and you won't think you need anything. And that's what Solomon's saying. So... Uh, let me remind you, it really translates, Philippians tells us this, it says this, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That translates this way. I need to get better? No. Nope. To do well? No. Nope. To be happier? No. Nope. To be loved? No. Nope. To get riches? No. Nope. I need Jesus. That's what Philippians 4.19 says. You have him, you have it all. And I understand about American, American prosperity, I understand about American materialism, and I understand about having things. There's nothing wrong with having things. But when they have you and you have to have them, something's wrong. All right, somebody can say amen anytime you want. Or stop it, Pastor Mark. You can say each, either one of those. He goes on and says this. A proud person will soon be ruined, but a humble person will be honored. Proverbs 18.12. So believe it or not, this verse goes right along with the previous verse on riches. We see here that a haughty or a proud heart, which is thinking too high of themselves, will bring destruction. Instead, the position of humility uh, is what brings someone honor. That is uh, almost, that's almost opposite in our world today. When I went to this symposium or this conference this morning, there were 500 men there. There's five men and women, uh, doctors from all over the world, and uh, most of them had their had their coats on, their white coats, and. Uh, you could instantly tell the difference with some, between somebody who had their, hair, their, their nose in the air and somebody who was humble. You could instantly tell the difference. People would come up to me and I'd, I'd look at them and you could tell. You could tell the ones that were, just felt they were above someone and the ones that were, And I watched some other nurses come in and healthcare workers and I watched some of the ones, and again, not judging, I was just watching people. I watched some of the ones just really not even bother with them, come over to the coffee machine and come over to where the pastries were and they would talk to their fellow doctors, anybody had a white, white coat, but they wouldn't really talk to the nurses. And I watched some of those doctors talk to the nurses and I thought, it is so obvious that these men have been hiding their pride behind their accomplishments and how much they miss in life. And so we see people do that not only with their position and their career, their education, they do that with their money. And Solomon knows that. He understands that totally well. And so he's saying a humble spirit. What is humility? Well, um, a humble man or woman that stands before God and men, Solomon says, will be loved and honored by men on the earth and by God himself. So if I could see that in men that I have not talked to and women I haven't talked to, if I can see that, imagine if they talk. A lot of them, I did hear them talk, and a lot of them were very condescending. Uh, now, some of them were very great, but some, a lot of them were very condescending. I was in the back uh, when, after the lecture was done, and uh, I heard one of them say, well, did you get, did, and he didn't know I was back there. He said, he said did you hear that invocation? And he, I noticed, it, obviously, he was talking about me. And um, so I just excused him, and I said, excuse me, can I have a cup of coffee? <laughs> and, but, you know, that without even talking in conversation, you can know how people are and their stance that they have. So C.S. Lewis said this. We talked about him. He says, True humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And that's extremely important. It's not that you're humble and you think less of yourself. It's not like you go around and you can't constantly put your eyes down. There was a girl, there was a woman, she was married, she was in our church, a cathedral, and, um, 
And she was a sweet lady. She had a sweet, sweet family. And every time I talked to her, um, she would be like this. She, her, she would never look me in the eye. And I noticed that she would never do that to anybody, any man that was there. And so one day I, I talked to her husband. I said, you know, you understand that that's not really good. It's not really good for her to cast her eyes all the way down. He says, I know. He says, I don't know what to do. He says, she knows. She has. well, let's, let's sit down and talk. And I had a counsel with her. And I very rarely sought out to counsel somebody. But she was such a sweet lady and there was such a sweet family that I knew that there was something that she... And she was feeling less than, than everybody else she talked to. Everybody else had something over her. They had education. They had this. And I told her, listen, you be who God made you to be. There's nobody more important on this planet than you. There's nobody more important in this planet than you. You cannot love your neighbor unless you love yourself. The Bible says, love your neighbor as what? As yourself. So if you have a low opinion of yourself, what kind of an opinion are you going to have with your neighbor? When I go into the grocery store and I see all those rag magazines and I see all those Hollywood stars and everybody and then somebody's going to come to town and everybody wants to get their autograph, I will never get an autograph of one single person. My autograph is more important than theirs. Sound, does that sound prideful? It's not prideful. What makes them better than me? Because they starred in a movie and got $21 million and now they're, and now they're, now they're politically, talking politically. What makes them better than you? What makes anybody better than you? Jesus died for you. You accepted his, his blood. His blood is the most precious thing in the universe. How many are with me today? We, have a, we think it all around, all wrong. You know, we, we honor people and basically we should honor God. And uh, so, I don't know, I'm going to get on my little soapbox here. I better stop. All right. The Bible tells us there are rewards for being humble, by the way. Um, grace. James tells us you get grace for the humble. Exaltation means being lifted up. You humble yourself, you're lifted up. Wisdom, honor, deliverance from wrath, greatness, and wealth and life. Wealth and life for being humble. Um, Proverbs 18, 13 goes on. Oh, before I do that, let me give you this. I want to give you, just in case, I want to give you a prayer for humility. Can I do that? Four of you want it. The rest of you are saying, hey, let's, all right, here it is. Lord, I am, too mu too, I am far too much influenced by what people think of me, which means that I am always pretending to be either richer or smarter or nicer than I really am. Please prevent me from trying to attract attention. Don't let me gloat over praise on the one hand and be discouraged by criticism on the other. Nor let me waste time weaving imaginary situations in which the most heroic, charming, witty person present is myself. Show me how to be humble of heart like you. That's a great prayer. That, take, that brings us right down to who we're supposed to be. In Proverbs 18, 13, I know I'm going quickly. It says, whoever answers before he listens, is, it is folly and shame to him. So, a person who answers a question before he hears the question, Solomon's saying, is a fool. How could you answer a question before you hear the question? That just makes that person look very foolish. Another way to say it is this one. Answering a matter before you hear the facts is both foolish and shameful. Another aspect of that, and one that might apply to us and me, all of us, is this. Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. Most of the times, and all of us are guilty of this. I, I was guilty of this for a long, long time. I had so much to say that somebody would talk to me and I really didn't hear anything they said. I really didn't hear a thing they said. All I wanted to do was tell them what I was thinking. How many of you, understand, how many of you know what I'm talking about? It's important for us to listen. I know what you think. I'm going to forget my thought. Well, if you forget your thought, you forget your thoughts. It's okay. It's more important to understand what somebody else... And you know what? People will respond to that. People understand the people who listen to them and the people who just listen to them talk so that they can get done, so that they can talk. Solomon said, don't be that way. Listen first. And all over Proverbs, all over Scripture, be a good listener. I have to work at that. I have to consciously work at that because I have a triple A personality. How many know what that is? That's an A personality on steroids. <laughs> and so I always want to share something. And I, I have to stop that. I have to, because there's so many other things that people want to say to me. And so I have to, I have to pull the rein in. That one hits me because I've got to pull the rein in on that one. So as we see this, let's just continue on and go on. So for years I did that. And I've realized I need to listen a lot before I talk. And thankfully, my family helps me do that. They remind me. Proverbs 18:14. The spirit of a man will endure... This is the, this is the one I wanted to get to. We're going to spend the rest of the time on this one. The spirit of a man will endure his sickness, but a broken spirit, who may bear it? Two parts to this one. And I want you just to, to look at it. I told you that there's these three points I've been telling you about Proverbs 18 uh, I, uh, that I'm making in Proverbs 18 are actually an outline for my experience with stage 4 cancer. And I really didn't realize that totally until I studied... This one I did, but I really didn't realize it totally until I started to really start studying this proverb for this study. The second point is this one tonight, that, about my sickness. 
And the first part of it is your spirit will sustain your sick body. We need to hear this tonight. Your spirit will sustain your sick body. I promise you this is a life verse for every single one of us. I promise you you're going to need this sooner or later. The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? Sounds simple, but I really want to give you the truth of it. Um, now, I'm not sure I can fully describe what happened to me when I had stage 4 cancer. People ask me all the time, and I told you, I'm not, it's not that I'm not comfortable speaking about it, it's just that it's, uh, it's something that happened in life. But if it gives glory to God, and I can accentuate what God's done for me, then I want to do that. But I can't, somebody told me, how did you go through it? You know, I was, when I tell you that I was at death's door, I was at death's door. Every day, uh, there were times that we thought, doctors would tell us, that I may not make it through a night. It wasn't like, oh, you just had cancer. This was extremely serious. It wasn't something that was even remotely innate. It was, it was tremendously serious. Uh, and it was a touch and go for several months of my life, especially some specific spots. So people ask me, how did you make it? And well, you know, like we make in India, it's day by day. You make it day by day. You try, to, you try not to think too far in advance. We're all planners. You need to do that. But we need to really let God be able to take a little spontaneity out of it for us and let us live day by day. How many are with me? We worry about too many things. You with me tonight? So I'm not sure I can fully describe what happened to me when I had stage 4 cancer, but it came on extremely quickly as, long as, as much as I think. And I may get the dates wrong. Cheryl knows more dates. I just kind of live my life. I think it was somewhere around August of uh, 2007, 2007 that I started feeling pretty bad. I think that's when it was, about August. I had gone to Israel five times that year. And so we thought that I was worn down. And of course I was from going there. But I had something like a, like a, a cold and, a, and, and basically my, it was like nasal, which I never had. And I thought maybe it was pneumonia or I thought something else. And it was a constant thing. And so I went to uh, ear, eye, and nose specialists. I went to several of them. Of course, they gave me the usual Z packs and whatever else there was, and it wouldn't do a thing for it. And so I, I continued, and I'm, I'm kind of, it's going to be hard to stop me from doing anything. I kept doing my schedule, what I was doing. And then I started to have a constant drip in the back of my throat, just a constant drip. And uh, I never had that before, and I thought, well, it's not really too serious, it's just a constant drip. And then to uh, alleviate that drip, I developed a cough. And as I developed that cough, I started to realize that. You know, I'm just not feeling right. There's not, and I'm, I wasn't in pain, nothing like that. So that year, towards the end of it, I remember doing a wedding, and I remember dancing at the wedding because when I go to a wedding, I dance. Because why else would you go to a wedding? So I remember dancing at the wedding, and I remember, I remember getting really flushed in my face. My face got extremely red, which which I really rarely did. And then I noticed that, that every time I did something, my face would flush and get very red. And then by January, that was in December of 2007, by January 2008, I would get chills and I'd get fevers. We lived in Pensacola, Florida, and I would lay on the couch, and, uh, and I'm not somebody who lays down. I got very tired, and I was never that way. And I would break out in all these chills. I would get so much chills, but when I would go to sleep, I would have this 101, 103 fever, and it happened for about a month. And uh, by February, I would get into night sweats. And again, I'm going to doctors all over the place, and they're testing me for... Q fever, which is something that you get when you're in Israel, when you're in a third world country and a bug bites you and they're testing me for everything else. I actually can get a little upset realizing that they didn't understand the, the basic signs of cancer, even though I was extremely healthy every other way. So as I went there, I was getting these night sweats before I went, and I'd have to change my clothes three times a night. When I'm talking about night sweats, I'm talking about they were, you could wring them out and uh, it was, I found out later that was tumor fevers. My body was loaded with tumors, stage four cancer, loaded from my neck to my groin with tumors. Every single lymph node in my body was full of cancer. And so I also, during that time, I had lost 45 pounds. Still no doctor's diagnosis of cancer. I finally went to someone, was it here? It was here. Finally went to someone right here. He was an internist, I think. And he said to me, he said, have you considered uh, getting, I want to do some blood tests. And I said, okay. So he did some blood tests and he came back to me and he said, you need to go see an oncologist. And I said, why? Well, he says, I think you have cancer, and I think it's in, it's in a pretty bad stage. So I went to, uh, to uh, St. Vincent's downtown, uh, met my oncologist. They took a, a bone marrow sample, which is, if you've never had a bone marrow sample, try not to. So I was awake. They put me on a, cow, on a cot. She took the needle, 22 needles, stuck it in my back hip, went straight through to my bone, which I felt, pulled out some, pulled out some uh, Material and she says, this, she says we're doing this, but nah, I don't really don't think there's nothing, nothing, nothing wrong. So they called me back. I think it was a couple of days later, and Cheryl and I were sitting across from her, and she said, uh, she had this look on her face, like 
she was messed up. And she says, because I was, what, 52, 53. She said, I, I don't know how to tell you this. She said, but um, you have myelofibrosis. And I said, and? She says, well, I really think you need to get your, go home, get your family together, and talk about it. And I said, okay. And so um, she didn't tell me. I said, is it, she says, it's the type of cancer you need to go talk about it before we talk again. So in the meantime, all my kids want to know what's going on, so I called them up, told them all. And uh, by the time I got home, how many know the, inter the internet is great because you can find anything out on it you want? How many know it's terrible because you can find anything out on it you want? My daughter had researched and she found that the myelofibrosis is incurable. They don't give you chemo, they give you nothing. Uh, basically, you have seven months to live and then you're dead. Everybody that gets myelofibrosis dies 100% in seven months until 11. And so when I got to my daughter's house, all my kids were there and all I could see them doing was just weeping and crying. So they told us, and you know, obviously when you get told that, something like that, you know, you got a, a pretty good reality check, and I went through all the emotions that I had to go through, and then I finally realized that, you know, this is something I'm going to have to trust God with, but my body was still sick. So I was immediately, then they brought me back and did another test on me, because they had another test to do, and the same doctor came out after knowing that I know about myelofibrosis, and she said, you also have stage 4 B-type lymphoma, which is another rare cancer. They're both rare. So I remember walking out of that office, and I've been wrestling with this for how many weeks. I remember walking out of the office in this parking lot, as a matter of fact, right out here. And I remember saying to Cheryl, well, if God wants me, he just loaded both barrels. Because if I, she says, but I think, the, the oncologist says, I think you can't. It's almost improbable. It's very improbable you can have both diseases. So I think we've, somebody's misdiagnosed you here, and I want you to go to MD Anderson. Never heard about MD Anderson. By the way, MD Anderson is probably the best cancer hospital on the planet. And so... Uh, you can only go there by, by um, reference. So she referred me there. They got me down there. As soon as I started taking me tests, they immediately, they immediately put me in a, in a bed and they kept me there. And uh, they, I remember my oncologist, Dr. Pro, sweet um, Italian lady. She used to, I, I remember she, she had these high heels she used to wear and I could hear her clicking down the hall. Um, but she came in and I asked her. After she took them all, she says, well, I'm going to tell you this. She says, uh, you don't have myelofibrosis. That was my very first miracle. That it wasn't something, I said, and I thought, well, that's good. She says, well, what you do have can kill you. And we're not sure we can get it. She said, because 40% of your bone marrow is dead. And she said, without your bone marrow, it's necrotic. Without your bone marrow, it, it, stage four is when it metastasizes. It went from my lymph, lymph nodes and started to eat my organs and go to my, my bone marrow. So 40% of my bone marrow died. And uh, without bone marrow, you can't produce red or white blood cells. You're dead. And so she, she said, we're going to do the most extensive chemo on you we can. Now, Chemo will kill you all by itself. Trust me, there is so much stuff in chemo because it's toxic. It, it, it's, it's invasive. Um, is it okay for me to tell you all this? Yeah. All right. The reason why people's hair fall out, and by the way, that's a trip. I was driving down the road after my first, when we came back here, I was driving down, I was very sick. And I came, we came back and I was driving down the road and uh, I had a full head of hair, believe it or not. And um, I remember going like this and when I went, brought my hand out there was a huge and I'm talking huge clump of, ha clump of hair this part was bald and I realized that this stuff is going every single hair on my body left me every hair except one I had one hair left in my eyelash and uh, my daughter said to me one day she said dad you got a hair on that eyelash I said leave it alone <laughs> it is my seed hair from that all the rest is coming back anyway to go back I don't want to go too far away so basically um, as I as she told me that I was going to get chemo, it's a very intensive chemo. It could hurt my heart valves. It can give me blood clots. It was extreme. One of them is called the Red Devil, which was a high dose of it. They have to have a nurse there when they put it in your arm because if it gets off of you, the needle and on your arm, it'll, it'll eat right through your skin. What chemo, what chemo does is it kills the fast-growing cells. The fast-growing cells in your body are cancer cells. They grow extremely fast. Hair follicles, that's why they fall out. Your toenails and your fingernails, which could come up off of the beds. And in your mouth, uh, you can get sores. I never got sores. My fingernails and toenails never came up. So, uh, but I was extremely sick. When they got me to MD, uh, MD Anderson, I remember literally wasting away, unable to eat or drink. And let me tell you, Cheryl will remember this. I haven't said this since we've done it. But Cheryl was there the whole time. You know, I'd go there for three days, extensive chemotherapy. I'd come back here and get blood transfusions because I had no, white, no platelets or red blood cells. So I got like 22 blood transfusions. That's a trip getting a blood transfusion for the first time watching somebody's blood come into your arm a red red intravenous I remember thinking when the first one by the way when I was getting my blood first transfusion in in um, UAB 
No. Same thing. Since I was getting my first transfusion, my grandson was being born at the, the, uh, the floor above me. My son didn't know whether to cry or laugh. And so it was a hard time. It really was. And I'm telling you all this because I'm setting up this message for you, okay? So I'm in getting my blood transfusion. My son's excited about his first son, my first grandson. Comes down to my room and it's like, his dad's dying and he knows it. And I remember sitting there and I remember thinking, the first thought I had, by the way, when I got my blood transfusion, they had the bag of blood there and it was coming through and I got 22 of them. And I remember when it was going to my arm, I thought, and I'm going to be honest with you, can I be honest? Yeah. I thought, I wonder what wino gave this blood. <laughs> and if I'm going to be an alcoholic after I get this. 22 and platelets only last three days. My platelets were down to nothing, which means if I scratch myself, I could bleed to death. And so it was one complication after another, after another. No end in sight, by the way. I developed bilateral cellulosis in my legs from the chemo, which means I was home. Uh, after one chemo, they gave me steroids. I was on 22 medications. I had to shoot myself in the stomach three times a day with three different shots uh, to regulate my blood. Um, and I was laying in my bed, and my, my, my uh, calves spasmed, just like you get a runner's spasm. How I many know how hard they are? Both calves spasmed, and they did not stop for three weeks. Uh, my, my legs turned purple, and I couldn't walk. And I remember being MD. I would, Cheryl brought me through so many, so many, uh, hos so many airports in a wheelchair. I've been through the hobby air airport so many wheelchairs. It's not even funny. Um, I got into my bed and in the, in the hospital because I had to get my chemo again. And uh, my bathroom was right there. I would stand on the side of my bed because I want to be strong. And I would rock for about 10 minutes just trying to get up and take that first step, which I couldn't do. So what happened with the bilateral cellulosis, my, my legs turned purple, I mean, like your shirt. And they said, you're probably not going to walk again. It's probably going to destroy all the arteries that are there. And you have blood clots all in your legs, and we've got to take you down because we're afraid they're going to go to your heart and kill you. It's like, so I'm lying there, and I'm, I'm trusting God, but you know, you're looking at, I'm looking at my body just waste away. And I remember praying one night and telling the Lord how sick my body was, like he didn't know. But I was telling him how bad off I was. I was just reading it down to him. Now, I was not complaining. I was not complaining. I was concerned for my wife. I wasn't concerned for my, for my life. I was concerned for my family. Um, I was okay. Uh, I, came, I came to grips with my, with my death, and uh, death doesn't scare me. And it, it did up until that point, but I'm okay with it. Uh, but I was concerned for my family. And so I remember telling God how sick my body was. Uh, it wasn't long after that I prayed that I picked up my Bible, and I read this proverb your spirit will, the spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness. And I recognized that what was happening in my body was horrible. My body was horrible. I mean, I was, I was a mess. The doctors thought I was going to die any moment. They told my son, my son uh, worked for a doctor and uh, he's a pharmaceutical rep. And they said, he told him about, he would tell them about my condition. And all of his doctors said, you need to go down with your father because he's not going to make it through this week. And so, you know, the family was called in and, uh, but something happened to me. It's really kind of wild. I read this proverb and I realized that my spirit is stronger than my body. And so I started to think about my spirit and not my body. I was concentrating on my body. I was looking at it. How couldn't you not? And I started thinking, remember it, Cheryl? I started thinking about my, I shared this verse with, with Cheryl and I started thinking about my body and I felt the Lord impress upon me that my spirit, not my body, would sustain me, would keep me alive. Uh, and it did. As my body weakened, my spirit got stronger and stronger and stronger. I got stronger than I've ever been. I've always been a strong Christian. I've never backslid. But I got so strong, it was unbelievable. I mean, I felt such strength spiritually. Uh, and it I was po I kept me positive. We had one doctor come in, and this is not, a, this is not a, a prideful statement. I want you to hear it. I started seeing these doctors come into my room. Like every 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they kept coming in. And I said, Cheryl, what's going on? And I was, I was on the verge of death. But this is right after this happened, right after I felt this strength. Um, and they came in they said, well, the reason why we're coming in here, we want to let you know, is that we've all voted you uh, the most positive person. I was, the floor I was on, they were wheeling people out dead every day. They said, we, I wanna, we voted you the most positive person uh, in this hospital. MD Anderson's a huge hospital. So if we had an award, we'd given it to you, and we want to know what's going on. And, uh, of course, I got to testify. We testified to everybody that was there. So I was very strong spiritually. And, and they knew it. They knew there was a difference. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple things and go on with this. It was an amazing feeling, by the way. The strength I felt had nothing to do with my physical body, not one single bit. For the first time in my life, I felt a strength that was not physical. I felt my spiritual strength actually replaced my physical strength. And this verse 
became a life message to me. I can tell you personally that your spirit, if you allow it, will sustain your sick body. Not just your sick body, your sick emotions. It'll do anything for you if you allow your spirit to move. Because you are, how many of you believe you have a spirit? Your spirit's inside you. I can't see it, you can't see it, but that spirit will sustain you in tough times. Now, let's look at the last part of this verse, and I'll come back to it in a moment. So the last part says this. Well, let me before that. When we are in decline physically and mentally, we can still grow spiritually. At the very end, it's the spiritual strength that lifts you up. And actually, it was the spiritual strength that kept me going. Spiritual strength is not how much you can lift. It's discovery of the Lord who lifts you. You can have financial strength, professional strength, emotional strength, but for me, without spiritual strength, none of the rest of it matters. I will take physical strength over any other strength every day of the week. So, search for the Lord in His strength and always seek His presence. That's 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11, by the way. And it, it, there it is. It says this, let, look to the Lord in His strength, seek His face always. So let's look at the last part of this and I'll get back to it. So it says, the human spirit can endure a sick body, but who can bear a crushed spirit? The worst wounds a person can have are ones that affect your soul, your spirit. They're the worst wounds you can have. There's this, uh, 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 so I want you to understand when the spirit is broken, people lose hope. One of the greatest things I had going for me, according to my doctors at MD Anderson, when I was being treated for stage four cancer, was what they called my will to fight. And let me tell you something, somebody's sick and you lose the will to fight, you die. If you have the will to fight, you are going to see some healing happen and, the God, and God can do it. I remember coming home after my second chemo when I was the sickest I was and they were every day, they, they thought I was going to die. I remember going to Cassie's house, my middle daughter who just had her sec, our sixth grandchild, which I never thought I'd see any of them. And I remember going to her house and she was living in Trustville and I remember I went to her door and I was emaciated. I, was, I could barely walk. I was on steroids, 22, 22 medications, shooting myself three times a day. I was, uh, my platelets were up that day, so I was able to see somebody. When they're not up, I couldn't have anybody around me because if a dog scratched me, I could die. And so my platelets were up that day, so I think I just got a platelet transfusion and a blood transfusion. So I went in, and I remember, I remember her eyes, and I remember her face. I imagine, I, she was so sad. And I knew what she was thinking. My dad's going to die. I knew what she was thinking. And so she said to me, um, she looked at me, and she was, her eyes were all tearing up, and she said, Dad, what are we going to do? And I knew exactly what she was saying. She was saying this, Dad, you're going to die. What are we going to do? And I, something happened to me. I took my hand and I slammed it on her, on, her door, on her table. And I said, I am sick and tired of being sick. This cancer is not going to kill me. And her eyes got like this. And it wasn't my body saying that. That was my spirit. And so your spirit is a powerful, powerful weapon against anything. I, got, I was angry. I was mad. I was passionate and I was determined. Cancer never crushed my spirit. I never felt bad for myself. I never pitied myself. I never wanted anybody else to pity me. And I really... Never felt like, like, I felt worse for Cheryl having to see me go through it than I felt for me going through it. So listen to me for a second as I get, as I get close to closing. So not only was my sus spirit sustaining me, but it refused to be broken. It's the absolute worst thing that can happen to anyone. I've told my kids since they were young, never, never, never give up. I don't care if you lose. I don't care if you come in last. Matter of fact, it's good for you to lose every now and then. I know everybody wants Alabama to be first and I want Auburn to be first. It's really good for both of those teams to lose. Because we, we learn more out of losing than we do out of winning. Oh, you're getting real quiet on me. <laughs> so let me show you what Winston Churchill said. There's a famous story about Winston Churchill, who near the end of his distinguishing career was asked to return to speak to his old school, Harrow, where as a boy he almost flunked out. The great day finally arrived, and after school's fanfare and acclamation, Sir Winston stood to his feet, acknowledged the introduction, and gave the following address, which is quoted in full. This is all he said. He said, young men, never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Never, 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 never. And he sat down. He was, that was his entire speech. Now, let me just weave around that just for a minute as we get close to closing. So, it's believed that Churchill gave this speech near the end of his career. He died in 1965, by the way. But he didn't. He gave it on October 29th, 1941. And he wasn't Sir Winston Churchill when he gave it in 1953. Until, he wasn't Sir Winston Churchill until 1953. And why did he say it? Because on August of 1940, Hitler started his blitzkrieg, his lightning war, and raid on London. 57 consecutive nights of bombing. 57 consecutive nights. It would continue until May of 1941. He never let up. He was using B rockets. He was shooting rockets over the, over the channel. He was bringing in bombers. They, they couldn't stop him. The people were going into air raid shelters. He destroyed all of London. The first day of the blitz, Hitler had dropped 337 tons of bombs on London. 
That's over 800,000 pounds in one day. Most of the people were in fallout shelters, or bomb shelters, but 448 civilians were killed just that afternoon. After 57 days of that, the people of London and the parliament were all over Churchill to surrender. They said, you have to surrender. 57 days, everyone, the popular opinion was surrender, surrender, surrender. Churchill was quoted as responding to the, resp the request for surrender. He stood in front of Parliament and he said this, in full, never give in, never, 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 in nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in, except the convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to the apparent overwhelming might of the enemy. That is the will to survive. Churchill knew it, and you can know it, and Solomon knew it. He knew that your spirit can help you survive in any hard time that you have. Man, how many are hearing this tonight? Five months later, he would put it in his speech to the graduating class of his old school. Let me give you one last one. That's what he's written on it. This one, probably most people don't know. I was driving home the other day, and I was listening to NPR, which sometimes I like and sometimes I don't like at all. And I was hearing this story of uh, this woman. Her name was, uh, was uh, Janine Shepard. That's her. Janine Shepard fascinated me, and I thought about this study. She was an aspiring Olympic skier. Janine Shepard was nearly killed when she was hit by a truck during a training bike ride. By the way, she was traveling in Australia, driving up her bike up the mountains of the Green Mountains. Um, paralyzed and immobile, the truck ran over her, crushed her spine, broke her arm, uh, tore her face, broke her leg, and she was paralyzed. So she was immobile for six months, which means she couldn't even move anything, but she was paralyzed. She was given a grim picture of recover, never walk, stay in a wheelchair. But not only did she teach herself to walk again, she learned to fly. Let me just share this with you. Janine Shepard was a walking paraplegic. Uh, defined her, defining her disability, she's become a commercial pilot, an aerobotics instructor, motivational speaker, best-selling author, and mother of three. A champion cross-country skier in training for the Calgary Olympics, Janine's life changed forever when she was hit by a truck during a bicycle ride in the Blue Mountains, excuse me, of Australia. Doctors didn't expect her to survive. After six months in hospital, near, nearly all of it on her back, Janine focused intently on healing both her broken body and her crushed morale. A turning point in her recovery came when a small plane flying overhead gave her the most improbable idea. That's it, she exclaimed from her wheelchair. If I can walk, if I can't walk, I'll fly. She encased it in a full body cast. Janine had to be lifted into an aircraft for her introductory flight lesson. But within a year, she had defied the odds and earned her private pilot's license. Her talent and skills as a pilot earned Janine a commercial pilot license and ultimately her flying instructions rating. She then decided to learn to fly upside down and finally to teach aerobatic flight to other pilots. Janine is an ambassador for Spinal Cure Australia and Red Bull Wings for Life and is committed to helping find a cure for a spinal cord injury in the near future. This is her book and this is her with her plane. This is something that you can't explain other than the spirit of someone. When the spirit is broken, people lose hope. I've heard doctors of medicine say that there's an element, an element, other than severity of the illness, and other than the medicine that they have to give a certain illness, it's called the will to live. A person who says in his spirit, I will not die, scientifically, heals faster, and to the amazement of doctors, sometimes lives when all help, hope is gone. On the other hand, you can give someone medicine that should cure them, and if they have no will to live, they'll probably die. The spirit of man is his life. Many die from a broken heart soon after they lose a loved one. You hear somebody, oh, they die from a broken heart. That's not just a saying. They really did. They lost the will to live. So, what's the secret of staying strong in the spirit in our world today? I'm closing. Avoid sinful situations. You're not going to feel like having your spirit raised when you're in sinful, evil canyons, sinful language, people who oppose truth, factitious brethren, worth, worthless arguing. I had people tell me when I was sick, well, you've sinned and you need to really kind of kind of ask God for forgiveness and he'll heal you. You know what I did? I stopped letting them even talk to me. Associate with godly people, not haughty, not associate with the lowly, not immoral brothers. Assemble with saints and flee and pursue righteousness. Becoming strong and staying strong, you need the word of God in your life. Every single day, Cheryl and I would read the word of God there and we'd open up my laptop and we would get literally thousands of emails from people all over the world. Remember, Cheryl? We're praying for you from Australia. We've heard your teachings. We've heard this. And man, it would just lift our spirits. Um, everything, divine nature, strength in the inner man, word, believe, perform work. Prayer, rejoice, pray without ceasing, rejoice, anxious for nothing. I had to learn how to be anxious for nothing. The I could not wait for the doctor's reports or anything else. I just had to say, I'm arresting you, God and devoted to prayer and keeping alert in it and sing to God. I can't tell you how many songs we sang, Cheryl and I all, all together by ourselves there. It's powerful, is it not? 
True strength is when you have a lot to cry about, but you choose to smile and take another step forward instead. I want to leave you with that tonight, and I want to ask you to bow your heads just for a moment. Let me remind you that I'm nothing special. I'm just an individual person just like you. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Things happen, and you're left with trusting either your own logic or you're trusting God. I am so thankful for Christianity. I am so thankful for the long time ago. I, I left the sinful world, left my life of drugs and alcohol and, and riding in motorcycle gangs and the tough guy image and bowed my head at an altar and cried before the Lord because it's literally saved my life. Christianity and knowing it, really knowing it will save you. Your spirit will sustain you. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you for those that are here and those that are going to be listening to this, Lord. I know that this word, not me, but this word will touch many lives. There are people right, right now out there, Lord God, whether it's on Facebook or whether it's on YouTube around the world, that are suffering. They're suffering from a physical ailment, an emotional strain, Lord God. I pray that this word becomes a life message to them, that the Spirit of God, their, that your, their spirit, based, by, based on yours, their spirit will sustain them when they're sick. Bless them today, Lord God. We give you the thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.